I'm Evan Douglas, the Dean of the School of Architecture. Uh, we have a fantastic lecture tonight. It's the first uh, Ken Warner Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I couldn't think of a, a finer architect in the world to give it, Tom Main. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about Ken. For those of us who knew Ken over his many years as a profoundly dedicated professor here at Rensselaer since 1968, he was a revered scholar, architect, educator, and inspired mentor to generations of alum. His heartfelt commitment to the school and the study of architecture had a long-lasting effect on the impressive lineage of students who were forever influenced by his generous and insightful contribution to their appreciation and understanding of this mysterious thing called architecture. Ken was a unique individual, individual with a rare combination of creative vision, intellectual curiosity, and sincere interest in inspiring others. He will be deeply missed, but his memory will live on through a yearly memorial lecture series celebrating the most visionary architects in our profession. Uh, and I want to extend special thanks to Jim Collins and Bruce Hamilton, uh, alum from the School of Architecture, who generously sponsored an endowment that will allow us to bring uh, esteemed architects from around the world on a yearly basis. And Bruce Hamilton happens to be in the crowd tonight. Bruce, would you stand up? I can't think of a, a greater way to, to show honor to Ken uh, for his remarkable legacy than bring a, a Pritzker Prize winner into the school. Uh, Tom Main uh, is, is extraordinary. Um, I first met Tom at Columbia University back in the 90s. Uh, he was sitting on juries, he was giving lectures. Uh, he was a tour de force. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, his entire trajectory in terms of uh, his role as an academic uh, and a practitioner. Uh, design director and thought leader of Morphosis, um, recipient of the 2005 Pritzker Architecture Prize. Uh, for the students in this room, that is considered the most prestigious prize an architect can win in the world, and it's an affirmation of being a visionary, being relentlessly committed to one's craft, uh, and having the extraordinary opportunity to move their imagination into the built environment. Um, Tom Main has won 25 Progressive Architecture Awards, 75 American Institute of Architecture Awards, and numerous other design recognitions including the Edward McDowell Medal 2008. Uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, AIA Los Angeles Presidential Award, the AIA California Council, the Maybach Award, the National Design Award, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the Alumni Merit Award, University of Southern California, the Pritzker Prize Architecture Prize, He's a fellow of an American Institute of Architects, FAIA, Chrysler Design Award of Excellence, the Gold Medal Los Angeles American Institute of Architects, Alumni of the Year, USA, we're going back, the Bruner Prize Award in Architecture, American Academy of Arts and Letters, solo exhibitions uh, at the Center Pompidou in Paris, the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Walker Arts Institute in Minneapolis, the Ministry, or Fomento in Madrid, a major retro retrospect at the Netherlands Architectural Institute, NAI, group exhibitions, Vienna, uh, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, in quotes, end of the century, 100 years of architecture exhibition, and the Venice Architecture Biennales, 2002, 2004, 2006, 2008. His works in the Permanent Museum Collection of the MoMA in New York, the MoMA in San Francisco, the MAC in Vienna, 
the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, the Frack Center in France. This is like, it's like introducing Michael Jordan within the discipline of architecture. Publications, 25 monographs, five from Rizzoli, two from Korean architect, uh, two from GA Japan, one from Fiden. He's one of the, the founders of SciArc, Southern California Institute of Architecture. And I gotta say, uh, you know, there are many ways uh, to make a contribution to our discipline. Certainly in, in the context of Tom's career, uh, you can't pin him down. He's doing it in magnificent buildings. He's doing it as an educator. Uh, he's doing it in the form of the genesis of a terrific architecture program called SciArc. And we were talking about it on the way uh, to Troy uh, from the airport and how uh, robust and dynamic um, and I would say healthy SciArc is at this moment. And in those early days, it was probably very rough. And anyone who can start a school of architecture, um, I think that's an extraordinary feat. Uh, he's had visiting teaching positions at Columbia University, Yale, the, the uh, Saarinen Chair in 91, Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Elliott Noyes Chair in 1998, uh, the Berlaga Institute in the Netherlands, the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Uh, he's a tenured faculty, he has a tenured faculty position at UCLA. Uh, and just a couple of, uh, of uh, observations and comments. Uh, the first time I met Tom was at Columbia University, uh, but uh, the first time that I met his work, uh, I was in graduate school at Harvard University at the GSD, uh, and there was an exhibition on the drawings of morphosis. Uh, and the lobby, this is, uh, you know, the GSD is certainly a great school, but it can get a little bit corporate at times, uh, and a little bit, uh, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to identify uh, those who are authentic and are willing to take risks in their work uh, because sometimes following the party line is a little bit easier. And I mean this sincerely, when that lobby was radically transformed by those drawings. Uh, and if I were to put a, a small list together of architectural drawings uh, in the late part of the 20th century that I think resonate with a profound um, commitment to research, to experimentation, to the poetics of architecture. These drawings were constructed. They were literally uh, two-dimensional, uh, but they had silver and gold leaf. They had been painted, they had been scratched, they had been lithographed. I mean, there was an enormous amount of affection uh, to find something, uh, again, within the poetics of architecture through the discipline of drawing. Um, and uh, it changed my life. I'm sure it changed the lives of many. A couple of other uh, observations. Uh, uh, I have uh, seen Tom in, in a variety of uh, uh, contexts, uh, and certainly one of them has been uh, on a jury. Uh, he's really a creative force. You know, you, it's a real test, I think, when you see um, the transition or the evolution of a young architect who moves into their maturity, uh, and uh, um, like a great wine, something remarkable emerges. But do they forget about the past? In other words, do they know? Do they pursue a direction or a kind of discourse where, well, that was that was when I was younger and I was doing more theoretical work. I don't do that anymore. I'm a, I'm in quotes a builder with a capital B. Uh, Tom Main is one of the few architects in the world that I think finds as much pleasure out of a sketch, out of a drawing, out of um, a, a kind of an experimental model that is in uh, its early stages. It's not entirely comfortable with what it's going to be or where it's going to land. I think that's testimony to someone who is not only brilliant but understands that architecture has to slip in and out of meaning and matter, in and out of things that are concrete and sometimes ethereal. Um, I would also argue that there's a select few of architects in the world today that are world leaders, if you can, if you can use that title within our discipline. That is to say that uh, the work that they make resonates uh, and like a domino effect has a huge impact on challenging the next generation of students and faculty and practitioners 
to use their potential, to use their imagination, to be absolutely, and that brings us to another term, fearless. He's absolutely fearless in his work and his desire and commitment to use architecture as a proponent for social and cultural change. Okay, so while the work at one moment may be enormously abstract, at another moment it turns into an institution, an institution, a museum, a school, and there are hundreds of thousands of people that are now recipients uh, of his gifts. Um, he's a benevolent, and I'm sure no one has said this about you, Tom, sage and mentor. I know countless young architects, especially in the West Coast, uh, that say, you know, Tom can break away from a jury, come up to me and say, How, how's your firm doing? How's the work going? Uh, you know, is there any way I can help you out? And I, and I gotta tell you, that's, that's a testimony to someone who has uh, an ethically sound position and recognizes that he's part of a larger community and helping that community is something that's just innate uh, to his nature. Uh, and with that, I just like to say it's a real pleasure and honor to have Tom Main speak at RPI. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Evan, you exhausted me. I could never live up to that introduction, so please don't expect that. Um, I'm also off of a 15-hour flight from Beijing and Shenzhen and Guangzhou, et cetera. And what I'm really going to do this evening is um, I'm going I'm to talk about three projects, and I'm going to um, try to um, communicate to you the, um, the genesis of those projects, how they came about. and. Um, it's going to be a, um, it's really me talking out loud. I'm asking questions myself, right? Because as I finish a work, um, I pretty much lose interest in it immediately and move on to the next work. But it becomes the material for the next work. And I'm going to take you through a series of projects, sometimes over a 10-year span, sometimes over maybe a 20 or 30-year span, that represent the, 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 the trail that I can make, right, that have to do with certain ideas. Um, and I should probably mention just briefly um, particular preoccupations which form, um, let's say, the value structure of the work. And I don't know how much you think about as young students, um, your work not in formal terms, but how they represent um, articulatable desires which are substantiated in values, who you are, who you are culturally, socially, politically, et cetera. And um, because finally, architecture is the, um, is the manifestation, right, of, those, um, of that value system. And it allows you to, um, it gives you energy, and it allows you to uh, kind of fight for those ideas, right? And um, it, you're putting something at risk, right? I ask my students all the time, at some point in this, what's at risk? What are we talking about here, what are, right? What are you gonna fight for? What is the, the absolute, uh, the most uh, 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 basic kind of notion that forms the, the, the under, underpinning of this particular project? Um, with myself, it's like it will be, I'm sure for all of you, it's, it, it's, an, it's an emerging process over many, many years, and it's why it's not unusual that architects mature at 50, at 55, at 60. It's, you'll know it's a joke. You're still called a baby if you're 50. Um, I went to Pritzker when I was just short of 60, and I was still called the bad boy, and I got really upset by it. And my wife reminded me, uh, Tom, they're, they're, it's, it's boy. Uh, you should be very pleased that this is taking place um, at 60 years old. And, but you are, you're still, um, you're, you're, there, there's, the, the profession is so enormous in terms of the, uh, the <coughs> what you're dealing with that um, it, it takes a very, very long time to, um, to mature. For myself, um, there's been a series of preoccupations that have been brewing from um, just after school, let's say, in my education. Um, one was started by a very particular professor of mine 
which got me thinking in a very, very different way about how we organize things in the most basic way. And he's a kind of Ralph Knowles. And um, he was very early um, looking at a biological versus a mechanical model and started thinking, me thinking on um, ideas of differentiation and complex um, organizational theory. And it's one of the things that I'm going to repeat over and over again. And with that um, is parallel um, operational strategies, the methodologies that um, you utilize to produce the work. And I'm a person that's been very interested in the um, the potential of auto-generative. Is that a word that you use here? We use it like in the 80s. It was really a big um, dropping a series of sticks and re recording them, taking a piece of trash out of the garbage can and cutting a section to it. And that was, the, that was the basis of the work, kind of challenging all normative ideas of order, certainly Cartesian ones. And, um, but as you produce rules, um, you recognize that you're inventing the rules and you're, you're observing and you're evaluating the, re the, the repercussions, the manifestations of those rules, which are the work, and that there's reciprocity, that the work now through the evaluation allows you to alter the rulemaking, which in turn produces right, um, alternative possibilities in, in, in the work itself. Um, there's been certain observations of the world, and um, some of them operate on an emotional level that probably I was already um, unconsciously uh, dealing with as a, as a fairly young child, and some of them deal with a, a broader, more um, conscious, intellectual, rational kind of s sphere. And, um, and those observations, like, um, what would be the best example? When, when Joyce wrote Finnegan's Wake, he was just really looking out the window and just recording what he saw. And what he saw was what we now call chaos theory, or we, we saw a kind of a complexity that was earlier than the scientific community or other, right? other artists, and it's, it, all of us do that. And, and for myself, um, I've been fascinated with notions of conflict and um, that conflict, that idea of, of, of dealing with the vast um, conflictual nature of our world as it becomes more and more observable um, is something that's preoccupied me and that immediately connected to an idea of complexity. And there's been a lot of discussion over the years about complexity for complexity's sake. And I'm really not interested in complexity as a formal idea. I, complexity as a condition. It just exists. We live in a world of the unknowable, right? It's impossible to even uh, understand a, a, the smallest fraction of, of the world we inhabit, right? And um, I'm fascinated with that notion of complexity, which drives me towards interests in operational strategy that can absorb more and more information uh, conditions, et cetera, and, um, and that allow me to speak about broader and broader um, range of topics. Um, with the notion of, of uh, complexity um, comes a very kind of particular looking at the, the setting of architecture. It's either with landscape terms or with urbanistic terms. And um, within that territory, I'm interested in um, specificity again and everything idiosyncratic. I see architecture as, a, um, as an art form that one of its specific territories is it's, it's uh, locatable and specific to place, culture, et cetera, right? And that that gives you a um, um, huge amount of kind of territory that allows you to, to, um, um, to uh, it gives you genitive material for your work, right? And, um, and it seems like that specificity is, um, required in cultural terms and in political terms and social terms and ecological terms, right? That, it, that it, it's, um, it's, sim it's sympathetic to that. If you think about the conflict, if you think of complexity, if you think about kind of the enormous amount of information that takes place in, in, a, in the, 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 uh, the, the formation of architecture, um, finally, it's about relationships. And again, I'm going to start this, this evening with the first project talking about that. And then I've, um, I think in the beginning, just intuitively, again, I think as you start your work, my sense is you probably operate more intuitively. You can't quite understand the nature of your the instincts and directions that you just, right, that get, that get you going. And, and if you stay with it, um, 10 years later, you, you've shifted a bit and you can maybe articulate those a little more. And, um, 
with me, it was just an instant uh, questioning of the object and the singularity of the object. And well, it was definitely promoted. Uh, I, I'm a 60s kid, and um, there, was, there, was, there was an exhaustion of modernism, and there was a series of questions taking place about the object, about the isolation of, of work within urbanistic terms, et cetera, that led me uh, more and more in interest of um, dialogue, that architecture is the formation of, of the relationships of things. And again, that'll be, I think, quite evident in the work. And, um, and, then, and then finally, um, um, I'm interested in the incomplete, the unfinishedness of something as it represents um, both, it, hmm, what is it? It's, um, it's referring to the act of making, uh, the act of constructing, constructing mentally and constructing um, physically, actually in terms of the tectonic. And um, it also represents the nature of our world in terms of um, the provisional. I believe in no theory, no religion, no philosophy. I find all of it absolutely provisional, uh, um, necessary, absolutely useful, but all of it is under question. There is absolutely nothing in my world that has a fixed nature uh, in, within an intellectual sense. Make sense? Right? And mm, I don't, I used to go into this and I kind of stay away from it now because to talk about religion or philosophy in this country seems to be somehow personal and much more difficult. But if we were going to have a really thorough conversation, it would again lead you back to a broad value system, right? Because you're going to finally link this to meaning something, right? That you're going to hinge this to some system of thought that these buildings um, connect to. That they, that they emanate from, right? Okay, with that, um, there's a non sequitur here that I have to start with, and it's personal because I in some way have to cleanse myself about being in this space. Um, I participated in this competition, how many years ago? Many. How was the building? Five, four, three? Whatever, six, seven years ago, whenever they did the competition for this building. and. Um, and we were, we were um, a series of things that were, were developing in the office. Um, the, the, the computation, um, uh, the parametrics, uh, the, um, the, the, the digital environment was, um, was in its kind of second phase in developing. And we were now developing, a, the models were digitally producing, uh, the physical models were being produced through a digital process. And we were using models in there. You're looking at the space we developed here as it emerges out of that process. And um, we had a kind of a very particular idea about the singularity of this, of this place, having to be um, an icon uh, on a very lovely site from the, from the town. And it, it developed very much um, out of that vision. And then um, what took place, it was really kind of a beginning of something for us. We were, um, the forum was actually quite pragmatic, the stacking, it was a little more vertical than this place. And, um, and then we were able to find a, a draping of the envelope. And if you look at these pieces, um, with, we were developing a system where we can push and pull and control this environment. And then in turn, the form now led us back to reinvestigate the, the, the simplicity of the program and to invest more of the language of the skin into the interior. And it became a, a push-pull project of a, a project which is forced from its internal workings, right, from its demands in, in terms of performance. All right, from the inside and its um, more architectural desires, let's say, in the, in, the, in the exterior and the use of the singular skin to simplify the, the total a construct, right, into, and, and, and um, well, it's not totally singular. You can see back here that, that pieces of it, but that singularity was important for the, its relationship to the site. Okay, I'm done with that. Okay, I'm going to talk about it is kind of weird. You'll, you'll feel the same as me when you're in this position, I guarantee you, because it's, um, it's really strange being in this way, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> um, architecture is so personal. You know, you get involved in this stuff and you're, it's, it becomes part of you and it's hard to kind of root it out, especially when you're in someone else's pajamas. Um, <laughs> I like this guy too, he's a friend, so it's not personal. Okay, but it's got three projects. And they're gonna be, um, 
purposely quite different. There are three recent projects. And um, I'm going to start now. You've listened to me discuss the various kind of interests that you're going to find embedded in this work. Um, and now I'm going to kind of simplify it and say that um, you could say that architecture is located in two different spheres. One is it, it deals with constraints, and it's pragmatic. It's its pragmatic sphere, and um, the other is it has broad organizational um, territory that, let's say, for the sake of argument, we'll just call the aesthetic, which is um, brought to the project internally, right, as as the, the focus of architecture, as a cultural act, right, and um, these two things. Um, are um, merge at some point, and if it if it overemphasizes the formal, we call it formalist, and it's um, criticized severely, or it's moving towards monument, right? We understand that if it moves in the other direction, it becomes functional and it becomes just a part of day-to-day -day life, and it's no longer even architecture. You could claim there is no architecture, there's no culture of architecture. It's purely pragmatic, and and in this country, um, I was reading a really fascinating article by by. Um, by, by Rich this weekend, and I, it occurred to me that the same dialogue that goes on, because we're a very pragmatic culture, um, in the architectural world is quite parallel to what's taking place now in our political world, and uh, at this exact moment of time. And reading his article, he was discussing the, um, the dialogue which questions the abstract notion of governance as it's embedded, let's say, in the Constitution. And, and the abstract idea that there's a, there's a connective tissue, which is, makes this country the US of A, which has to do with this abstraction of a broad notion of common good that has to do with people living together and a set of rules that takes place, which are um, highly conceptual, all right? And that you have to give in to that at some point, or you have to understand the nature of that in the terms of um, what it means to live together. And in this case, it's something that, well, there's a question whether it's evolving or not evolving. There's people that say it should be like the Constitution, but it'd be hard to, hard to imagine that 250 years ago, people could imagine the world the way it exists today, and it'd be impossible, of course, uh, much less the radicalness of our pluralism, our heterogeneity, the nature of what this country is, right, et cetera, et cetera. What's funny is that same argument is in architecture, and you're going to find it immediately as you walk out of this place. And there's actually still schools that sway well, there's less now, but there used to be you could locate schools very clearly that were kind of the pragmatists where you could question whether architecture even existed in its, in its, in its real form that saw um, program or site as actually what architecture was. In fact, that was just at Cornell, and I gave a very abstract project, and my students uniformly told me, you cannot make architecture without a program, without a site. And I said, excuse me? They have absolutely nothing to do with architecture. They're the constraints of architecture, and clearly they're going to form it, inform it at some point, right? But architecture relates to a broad um, conceptualization, right, of what it is or isn't, right? And that's how it starts. Okay, and these projects are going to be very much about that because two of them are going to be constraint driven, and the last one is going to be um, conceptually driven. Right? All of them, of course, have to do with the connection of both. It's impossible, right? And, um, but it's important because I think um, a majority of our world is actually, of course, made up of the constraint-driven projects. That's 99.9% .9 of architecture you see, right? But what we probably admire, I would guess that for sure young students admire, is you probably admire the conceptual aspect of the work, right? And that's the work that really um, entices you that you immediately kind of gravitate to because you understand immediately the nature of the, um, the distance between or the, the struggle to organize um, the, the, the vicissitudes of day-to-day -day life, the, the vast contingency that we deal with into something that has a, a clarity in, in formal terms, in conceptual terms, right, in ideological terms. Okay, uh, Far Tower. Um, we won a competition I was just told today, that was three years ago, four years ago, um, for a, a, a quite an interesting building I'm going to talk about. But before I start that, um, I'm going to discuss kind of what got me there. Um, middle 90s, I was working on a project that uh, was really for my own house, but we realized in the beginning, in, from the very beginning, we'll never build it. And so it just became a, an object of desire and it became a research project. And it was um, the beginning of um, 
uh, looking at a piece of work which absorbed the particular, it was an, it, um, it reflected interpretations of the specificity of the site. So as you looked at the beginning of the platonic um, um, distorted cube, that each of the, 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 the elevations uh, became specific to its site, and it was the, the, the external urban forces were forming the singular, singularity. Um, it should be reversed just before that. Um, one of our first little houses, uh, the Cohen House, um, it's a house, but it was immediately envisioned as not a single piece of work, but as um, a village. And it was seen as a series of things, and it was about the relationships, including the, the, um, the external part of the house, the, the swimming pool and the deck, et cetera. And it was all about the relationship of connection and not the singularity. And again, um, one of our first buildings in Los Angeles, a single building, which is really two buildings, and about the relationship of these things. And after that, it adapts to performances and functionalities, et cetera. Much later, 10 years ago, uh, a project in um, for a, um, the housing facility for the University of Toronto, where now um, we've developed a, a strategy of multiple elements that make up a larger urban construct, and those elements are now are highly specific to its environment, and each one of them can be talked about in terms of um, some particular interpretation of uh, the particular nature of the complexity of that environment. Um, the second discussion has to do, and I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about far now, um, that's urban, um, has to do with performance. And it, it's funny, I just came up with this, this image. And um, the, in the bottom right corner is Prouvé. And I, it's the only time I've shown another piece of work in any of our monographs. And, it, and I didn't even realize that this is done um, 30 years ago. And uh, it's our first project at Sequoia School. And I was, again, hugely influenced by um, this particular professor of mine at um, USC. And the building was about a, a building that would highly organize itself through its response to its environment. And, the, um, and it was neutral in terms of architecture. Well, um, the idea of um, skin became evident in our project in Seoul, Korea, which is at the end of the 90s. And in this case, I guess I'm not, we're, we're hybridizing it. It's, it's in a way still closer to 6th Street and that we have a very generic building and we're trying to give it specificity to its urban condition and we're trying to develop something that you see is um, in, in very different terms based on where you are. It's not a singular thing, right? It's dynamic, you keep, it keeps evolving into a different form based on your position in the city. And uh, it's very much a formal idea. It was a headquarters for a, a design group and um, the skin was also connected to um, kind of my interest in, in fashion design and in this case, the Ishimiyaki. He's a very fat, he deals with the thickness of skin and I, the idea of, of, um, of surface that has um, volumetric characteristics I was fascinated with. And, and then with that came ideas of origami and, um, and a, a, the set of rules that makes this. And we developed a kind of a discipline and a set of rules that allows us to understand this. And we were just starting with the computer environment and it was allowing us to understand um, the nature of material language, which was getting much more literal to the nature of reality which means we're no longer looking at um, formal notions of proportionalities, solid voids, that type of thing. We're looking at very particular notions of materiality having to do with translucencies, transparencies, et cetera, which became the focus. And then, of course, it was the space in between, this, um, the pragmatics of the office building and the, the broader aesthetic desires of the skin, which is going to lead to another project and then the interior, which uses the same kind of notion. And then, not too far after that, um, we got our first very large project in, in Austria, and the skin was now becoming performance-based, and it was, um, it was operating, controlling solar forces, and it was also um, diversifying, and um, it was playing roles that were somewhere between the formal and um, documenting the force of the site, and the, uh, the, the, the broader notion of the dynamic of the site, and um, as well as um, the background for particular events, and, but at the same time now was deeply involved in performative issues having to do with environmental response. And then um, three years later, we're working at Caltrans um, through another competition, and now we're working full on in terms of environmental response, a west-facing building, and we're producing a highly efficient skin 
um, which is um, dealing with the, the kind of the worst sun control condition and playing a role in developing um, the facade. And we've left a piece of infrastructure to, to talk about the nature of just that facade as an isolated animal. We've used a human being as building material as part of that, as part of the dynamic. And then um, with that came a broad urban program, a public space, um, and a nature of a, something that was dynamic and that, that, in, that um, uh, dealt with the uh, passivity of the Los Angeles environment. And again, um, a series of facades now are all performance driven. The south face are briselets made out of solar panels. It's the largest vertical, it still is, in the west coast. Produces about 4% of the energy of the building. And then just parallel to that, we were starting this um, just six months later, was our building in San Francisco. And it's gonna deal, well, now these are two things. It's gonna be a, a ground condition and a skin. And um, seen in the city, it has a direct south facing facade and you're gonna see it re represented in the building. We've now produced, um, we're working directly with performance. We're gonna produce a building that we took the air conditioning out the first time in the United States. And um, uh, we're dealing with a, um, a federal building in the United States. It becomes a, a prototype for the federal government and it's moving in a different direction. The North Face are now glass facade dealing with, um, with um, the movement of air. Let me see, I'm missing. So funny. The computer really got screwed up a little while ago and I can't get it to work. I have a, a drawing thing here that I can't live without. That I guess I have to live without. Let me see if I can do it another way. Huh. Anybody a genius out there? I mean, what they do? Oh, wait a minute. Uh oh, how'd I get that one? Felt pen, right? Wow. Well, got me. Um, can you see the arrow on the screen? Okay. Um, this this double this double scan is going to control light and and a whole series of public events that parallels that the, the very very large kind of main central space a daycare center and a whole social order which is another conversation a park on the 11th floor of San Francisco is best pocket parks and it's part of the broad social urban structure and um, a, a skip stop you get off every three floors Corbusier and um, and there's a, again an, a secondary social structure and the, the park now becomes um, a, a, a part of the San Francisco. Um, broader community, they have weddings, et cetera. And wow, this is so weird. Oh, that's the one I drew on, huh? Okay. Um, entry into that main space. <laughs> uh, damn. Um, we're working now in a totally integrated environment. The drawings and the models um, are uh, integrated from the very beginning of schematics. So when we're, we're drawing, we're, we're drawing reality. And that's kind of a shock, really, because you're no longer drawing abstract drawings, that the drawing is a representation of something, it is the thing. So when you draw a stair, it is the, the, the dimensions and the material you're drawing, which is really kind of frightening. And um, when you model it, it's uh, totally integrated, structurally MEP, and so it, it vastly um, pushes you within the pragmatics of the, the, the tectonics of architecture, which is, I think, both a, a very difficult thing and a useful thing at the same time. It, it just requires a very different thinking. This um, major central space came out of that. And then again, the, um, the skip stop pieces and the secondary lobbies where there's conference rooms and tea rooms and, and uh, where we're dealing with um, the debalkanizing of large institutions uh, culturally. And uh, the spaces that came out of the space are now parts of meeting spaces, the stairs, and the skin. And again, this one we pushed to the extreme and we literally took the air conditioning out and put it in the skin. And um, uh, it moves and it requires uh, the, the response directly to the, the solar response and the backside deals with wind and the guidance of wind from the north, which is a consistent and it pushes the air through. It looks super simple. It actually took us two years with OVRAP engineering and um, Berkeley Lawrence Labs to actually make this work. It works off servos. It gets information on a three hour um, a, a time advance from NOAA. Happened to be that we designed NOAA by coincidence. And um, it's actually a quite complicated process. And the, the cosine curve of uh, concrete absorbs, it absorbs um, a cool air, et cetera, and re-radiates at night. And then the, the payoff is enormous um, from the, from the um, average building to our building. 
and the payoff is um, um, the complete powering of 600 homes. And it doesn't sound like much, but 10 of these buildings is 6,000 homes, and 6,000 homes is a community of 20,000 people. And you, you understand the importance of this. And I think uh, what was really interesting on this one is that, again, I've been located as a, a formal architect my whole life. And I love breaking boundaries. I like it in the work, and I like it personally. And all of a sudden, we became greener than green. And I'm invited all over the world to green conferences. And it's just hilarious, because it's like I don't belong. You know that there's green guys, and there's kind of architects. And uh, it started in the 60s in my generation. And I remember going to Berkeley or MIT, which were the green places. And literally, the joke was wear an old suit, because they're going to be throwing vegetables at you, because they literally detested architects if they were in any way aesthetic. They just slapped solar stuff on roofs and said they were, and it was also loaded with moral kind of a rectitude that always just totally pissed me off. They were this kind of superiority about this morality, which is just total bullshit. Okay, that stream of consciousness, if I did it anything closely, um, if I touched anything, th this building should become totally self evident because this could be. Um, a set of forces that have to do with um, its urbanistic characteristic, um, a non-site really, and it's going to have to do with performance. Um, uh, and it's going to be highly developed by the, um, the constrictions that I'm given, right? And um, the architecture will form out of a response to that. So you're looking at the, the early competition models. We probably went through 40 to get to the project. And um, you should know that um, Oh, total bummer. Um, the Far Tower was uh, the losing um, entry to the Eiffel Tower. It was really a fantastic thing. Uh, it was second place. It was a single light that was going to light all of Paris. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And, uh, and then, of course, Eiffel got it. And um, uh, we have to be a couple centimeters shorter. It's Paris. and Well, it's not actually Paris. It's um, La Défense, which is really um, Cobavois and Puteaux, as the little towns. And, uh, but still, you can't surpass this building. But it's a big building. It'll be the tallest building in, in, uh, out of my hotel window. The tallest building in Paris. It's um, 300 meters, 1,000 feet. And um, like Korea, it's meant to be dynamic. As you see it from different positions, it keeps changing. Um, it has this incredibly impacted site. It's on top of the RER, a metro, an edge of a freeway. Um, it's next to the, um, the, um, uh, the, the Knit, which is the entry point from the metro. Uh, the end of the Grand Arch, which is, of course, the end of the Champs-Élysées. And we're looking back about four kilometers to the, to the, the Grand Arch. And, um, and it's not a single building like a huge amount of our work, and then going back to that first project in, in Cohen House. It's, in fact, um, four buildings that come together to make a, um, a collaboration. And um, as you look at it, it changes quite radically in terms of its interpretation based on kind of where you're positioned in the city. And then it's highly contextual to its, um, the localization of the rail. Um, this is the end of the one metro. Uh, over a half a million people come out of this every day. And um, the connection will be through a pavilion and um, uh, through the Knit. Um, the Knit, of course, is Nerve, beautiful, beautiful shell. Oh, that, that thick, absolutely amazing piece of work. Um, and um, the movement, um, we're moving about 20,000 people are coming through the Knit into the, um, um, the, uh, the pavilion and then up an escalator. Uh, there is an alley you're going to see that comes through right through the middle of the building that connects the University of Cobalt from the site. And so there's no middle, so it's, it's, on a, tri it's a tripod. And this is an absolutely fascinating kind of site. And um, you're seeing here, you're moving up from that into the um, eighth floor. You're at about 120 feet. And then there's this large space, um, 20 stories high, which is the entry space. And then again, that movement space. And you're moving up escalators. And as you're moving up, you're looking back at Paris. And you can, you can see the, the, um, the, the, the axis as you're moving up the elevator. And it's highly kind of urban, because we, we, we saw the movement from the public system into the building is singular, and you're still within the public sphere. There's no um, uh, singular um, boundary between private and public, right? The public is, it takes you all the way to the lobby, and then the lobby, because of its scale, participates in that, and it's 20-story heights, et cetera, et cetera. And it's in some way parallel to the Knit, 
as a space. And then as you move up, you hit to the, 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 to the lifts, and these are stack lifts on two levels because of the numbers of people. And then um, you're looking at um, the, a model we just finished of this entry space. Um, and uh, it's, I think it would be quite extraordinary. All the public activity is on the left side that moves out into this space. And there's, again, this double skin and this interstitial kind of layer, which is not conditioned between indoor and outdoor that you move through. And then, again, that skin. And then the plans. And because of the site condition and our approach to the project, there's no two plans in 80 floors that are the same. All right? They vary. And it was uh, quite a piece of work. Um, in fact, it became really interesting work. This is an um, office building. It's a speculative office building built by, um, by Unabai, the largest um, uh, developer in, in, uh, in France. And, um, and yet it has a complexity. It's much more parallel to a public building, a museum, or something, because of the nature of the site and our definition of this project as it moves from ground to sky. And then um, using the work we did in San Francisco, the forum now had very much to do with positioning of east, south, west, the skin. So we're tracing the skin. That back face you saw cut off is due north. And um, we're producing this kind of highly efficient kind of shape with this double skin having to do with the solar. And now we're. Um, we're rationalizing, we're organizing um, through scripting. You guys do scripting here? Amazing, right? You, you actually, oh, I'm kind of conflicted about its race relationship to architecture in, in one sense. It's, um, you give it performance values, right? And it allows you to understand within a set of rules, right? The, the possibilities for that. And this building has been, um, I've had two guys that have been working for two years that have had to rationalize a skin that started with uh, 5,500 individual pieces and a structure, ditto, and uh, into families. Uh, it, it, it unfinished. It's kind of evolving at the top. And then with that are, are, are um, wind turbines. And then again, we're studying the facade. And we're now putting this into families. And it's going to look like the same shape, but it's not the same shape at all because we've gone from a highly individualistic set of pieces to one now that we can start putting in families, and we're still working on that. And finally, we're here, and you can see we still have something like 60, but we've got the first, oh, 4,500 within eight families, and we're still working on it. We'll have it down to probably 15 families with maybe 100 unique parts by the time we're done. And again, the nature of the skin. And of course, now, through scripting, through the, the, the uh, understanding of performance of the building and the tools we have, um, each of these 5,000 panels, if you look at this closely, there's a date on every panel. And we can tell you the optimal kind of operation right, of that panel. And we can adjust it and, and, um, and work with it performance-wise, um, a model. And again, the, 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 the early drawing, the, the schematic, the DD, the working drawing, the physical model are all the same thing. They're just different outputs. You know that, right? Because the drawing you're making, if you, you can output it as a, a drawing, a model, a section, a plan. It, it's, it's the way you want to look at it and talk about it. And then kind of early studies of the skin. And then the, an evening cycle where we're going to use light that traces the, um, and makes more sensuous the softness of this, this skin. We are in Paris. My, Operating mode was the film Moulin Rouge was my, uh, <laughs> I, every about two weeks I'd go back and look at that film again. Do you remember the coloration and the cinematography in that? It's just absolutely astounding, right? It's uh, it'll make you weep. OK, Cooper Union, um, second constraint-driven building, um, hugely, hugely uh, driven by um, the pragmatics, meaning um, it's a Houdini kind of project. Um, tie both hands behind your back. Connect them to your feet, roll you up, put a bag around you, throw you in the pool, and say, uh, now give us a building that everybody's going to love and cherish. And um, this is going to go all over the place. It's about Icon. And when I started the courthouse in um, Oregon um, that we won off a competition, the Chief Justice, who only had one vote and wasn't used to that, Chief Justice, you realize in our tripartite system, the, the courts are the most connected still to the English system, the most, um, although they're collegial. They wear the robe. They expect you to stand on and on, right? And um, uh, he actually um, wanted Bob Stern. I think. <laughs> he actually wanted. He took me back to Washington as if I'd, I'd never seen this building, and, and walks me through the Supreme Court and says, "I want one of these." And I just laughed outrageously. And and um, 
and, and, and reminded him that when Cass, did, Cass Gilbert did this, it's actually a steel frame in a completely modern building. And it, it's the most confused, if you actually really read it, right? It's the actually most uh, outrageously confused piece of work, and um, which is mimetic in the worst sense possible, because we had no idea how to represent who we are, and uh, whatever. And, but I also reminded him that we could build a portico, and the budget was done. We'll put a tent behind that, right? We were, we were, we were completed. And, um, and I got him involved in another organizing system. I'm going to say just briefly, um, because I'm going to end with this. Um, I don't think there's a direct connection between a literal connection between a broad conceptual organizational idea and the work. It's used as a mechanism to um, allow you to expand your thinking and to, um, as a departure point. And it's very difficult to explain this to um, uninformed clients, really. And, um, and so I went to work, and this is a very, very bright man. Uh, he studied case law. So his trajectory is the opposite of your education. He goes backwards, right? There's nothing that goes forwards. Everything goes backwards through history, right? And, case, and it's based on precedent. Well, precedent for... Um, certain architects, myself, is going to be useful, but not useful literally, because I have absolutely no interest in the over-articulation of history. I think it's the, the huge problem in this country, really, that there's so um, little understanding of, of the potentials and aspirations and um, um, enormous possibilities that take place within architecture that it's absolutely absurd to place such huge um, uh, kind of overemphasis on the, the history of something. And it also seems so totally inappropriate to this culture, which actually has very little to do with the history that it's looking at, right? And, um, and in, in fact, has made huge um, inventions, which are, uh, that if you're looking at the nature of our culture, which in fact um, have um, somewhat radically left and de departed its European precedence, et cetera, right? And whether it's in political terms or cultural terms, social terms, uh, architectural terms. Anyway, so I, I got involved in the Dow of fishing and uh, looked at a series of orders of a very ordered notion of how um, this, this, um, uh, the lure touches the water and how that's an absolutely um, describable organizational idea. And out of that came a, a kind of a concept of a connective tissue that organized a series of courts in this case. And um, because I did have to um, develop a rationale to locate the project. It'd be not possible to deal within some intuitive sense. It just feels this way, I sense this way. And again, um, I'm, uh, I'm a cusp guy, because I came out of the older education. I'm not like you. You're the new generation. You're all computational people. I drew. And I'm in this middle world where I believe in the authority of the line, so I can draw a line, and that line carries with it your totality of your intelligence, all right? So um, I can understand CISA and admire him, but at the same time, I'm suspicious of that line. I recognize that's old school, and it's limited because your um, Kiso says you can deal with seven pieces of information simultaneously. Mo most people can handle three max. And um, you're limited. And I'm interested in operational strategies, which I'm going to end with, um, although this is part of, is dealing with much more com increasing the complexity that you deal with and also unsticking the limitations of um, facility or intuition. And I, you can see that, I think, if you observe most architects over 50, you've, you've, you've just about ended your creative part of your career. You've used up, you've exhausted right, what we call facility or what we call instinct, right? And that um, all of us would be interested in increasing shelf life, because that's what we do, right? And so it's also a very personal kind of operational thing. And then out of that came these services, and out of that came the building. And um, the building was, again, all about connective tissue. It was open-ended. It was discussing very literally here, and we had hours and hours of conversation discussing um, the interpretive idea of the Constitution versus the fix, which, of course, we were at opposite sides from the very beginning. And um, but it seems like we finally um, found a resolve to that. And then if you look at the courtroom, the singular room, um, I could spend an hour discussing the nuances of this connected historically, because I have to. All right? and, uh, but when you see it, you recognize the element that now uncodes the language of the exterior. 
is absolutely connected to the singularity. And in the courthouse, um, the courtroom is the singular element that is the iconic piece that has huge, huge kind of power. And again, um, any good judge um, can, can give just an absolutely a monumental conversation about the nature of the courtroom and the, um, his responsibility of literally deciding life or death, right? And it's a really, really interesting problem. And then um, the Caltech astrophysics, uh, I won't, it's a Cartesian piece and we're using lines of force. Um, they basically deal in um, particle physics and we're using those lines of force to um, kind of alter this Cartesian piece and to produce um, a public space which literally is the receiver of a series of force lines as they find their way through this piece and they lead you to various um, elements of the building perceptually. Okay, and the Cooper Union. Um, before, uh, this is a drag. I even started that and that and that finished the program, right? Um, laboratories, given size, repetitive, X amount. Um, um, faculty offices, that made up about 80% of the office, right? Um, the shape of the building, oh, it's slightly altered here. I didn't show it, it's generic. Um, the zoning, the program had done already. The zoning had already done when we, when we won the comp. We won this, actually. We, we beat Zaha on this one. And um, the shape of it, a cube with another kind of cube, a, a, a piece kind of pushed back and all that sort of, was the zoning envelope, done deal. Couldn't move out of it, hard to move in it. Um, ended up that they used two different architects and the program, which is no surprise, was bigger than the site. So we also had to work out how to get an additional 20,000 square feet out of this, the thing. And so um, from the very beginning, right, immensely kind of pragmatic project and um, we're gonna proceed on that basis. And um, out of that came this. And um, I guess I should start with a, a very simple discussion of, I think in all of the work, the first questions don't start with a formal premise, they start with a series of questions. And the first questions um, for myself have to do with how does um, architecture participate with this particular problem, right? And how does it, so if we're doing a school, if I'd have showed you, I'm gonna maybe later on, Diamond Ranch, um, we're trying to participate in the nature of is, is, is architecture, uh, can it be a didactic act and it can participate in people's thinking and conce conceptions, right, of how we operate in the world and mathematics, geometry, materiality, tectonic, blah, 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 right? And uh, it becomes part of the same here. And so um, we're looking at the nature of the exterior and this very particular part of, of New York, a very active, kind of gritty, kind of the original New York, a really amazing kind of a, a piece of New York that's at, at, at Astor Place. And um, it's gonna respond to, um, it's gonna move from an orthogonal to a more um, um, fluid kind of language as it moves towards the foundation building, the existing building. And it's gonna um, represent the public and non-public kind of aspects of the program, which will get clear. So this carve into it literally kind of opens up the public space. And we're now using the skin performance again, uh, I won't even talk about it, but it's the first uh, platinum building in, in New York, and that's now just a kind of a given. You don't have to even talk about it. It's just a, it, it's a, compul a compulsory, right? It's like Olympics. You do the first five, and then you get to do the last one. That it really get to be what you can do. And um, uh, the, the skin is um, now going to perform in terms of its connectivity to the environment, and it's going to deal with the um, kind of rethinking of this abstract shape, and it's going to carve open, and it's going to suppress all the pieces that we're not interested in. And it's gonna make, it's gonna make very didactic and open up the public part of the building. And the school, of course, um, Cooper is unique um, in, in its relationship to art, engineering, and um, architecture. It happened to be, by coincidence, a huge influence. And when we started SciArc, we were looking at the AA and Cooper primarily. And that's a school I was extremely familiar with. And John Haydick, who was the, uh, had, I guess, a 30-year run there, was somebody that had huge, huge influence on in my own thinking. And um, of course, New York is nothing but the uh, intellectual creative capital, that, the, the intensity of that energy. And we're putting that back on the street. 
And um, the, the, the opening of this is nothing more but that. And, and then the ground floor is all a part of the connective tissue of the urban environment, which is so much part of um, the city and this particular place. And it was really interesting because um, when we got there, the community um, hated the school, did not want this building, and I had to do all the presentations. And it was um, it's a, right next to a Ukrainian church, and they wear these orange scarves. And you know this area, any of it's really it's beautiful. Um, it, it, absolutely one of the best parts of New York. And they were ready to kill me. And, and they looked at this thing, and they, were just, they thought it was a horror story. And strangely enough, um, and I'm not saying this to compliment myself, they love this building. Because most people either hate it or love our work. Like the one in LA, the, Cal, the Caltrans. Oh my God, they, they, they've named it all kinds of names. They just hate it. And um, for some reason, it's, um, I think it's very gritty and very tough. And although the language is 21st century and they're in the 19th, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th, um, there's a sense of that, right? Very inexpensive. You built this for nothing. And the concrete's not, it's unfinished. It's a structural concrete, not finished concrete, on and on. The floors are just rough concrete. And it, it, that grittiness, I think, kind of comes through when you see the building. And these, um, the dynamicism of, of, the, of the ground. Um, uh, I was very interested in developing something completely complementary to the, to the foundation building built in 1850, heavy stone building. And we wanted something light, and it was graceful, and it was literally kind of doing this, yeah? and um, offering itself to the public. And then we, we, we try as much as we can to, to help the, the skateboarders. And um, the, the, the school immediately put up these little things. I just begged them not to do it. And, um, Khan wrote a beautiful piece, I don't know, I can't remember, it was years and years ago, about a day in the city of a child that lasts in his lifetime, I'm paraphrasing it horribly. And um, I don't know what thing people have with children. I mean, that's, they should be, instead of graffitiing things and fucking things up, can I say fuck here? <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, that's a whole other conversation. And, um, and then um, locating the problem. Um, its connection to its urbanistic environment and its relation to its um, academic educational ideas, which have to do with connection and um, de balkanizing radically. So, we're looking at kind of flows of people through 11 floors and trying to make that singular. And um, kind of the early drawing of that was we're going to connect engineering, art, and architecture. It sounds easy. Does it happen? Very difficult. Complete different wiring an engineer, an artist, and an architect. They're literally the synaptic stuff is just couldn't be more opposite. So you promote it, right? And the, your, your work is there to do that, right? And um, the studies of that, I'm the only one that still draws on top of stuff. And then again, we were studying the opacity. I wanted a form. It had to be a, um, a singular form. It had to be read as a form. It had to have strength, right? But at the same time, um, it had to have transparency for connection. So this is one that was still very solid. Right, and it, it wasn't going to work. The, the whole notion is to that people had to be connected, and then it moved to something much more open as we use the the diagrid and that fluidity. And then um, again, I could give a whole discussion about this. It's made out of two pieces: one straight and one curved. Um, young woman in my office spent a year and a half making this work. And again, um, well, like Paris, um, movement, public movement became principle. You walk in and go up a stair, and as you go up the stair, it goes up four floors and goes right out the building again. So you're never really inside or outside. It's all public. And then you appear to this large space that takes you to the uh, upper studios. And then um, that stair, as it pierces the ground floor, and you get a piece of this diagram that kind of flows out, that begins a vertical sequence. There's just two sequences, the diagonal of the stair, which is really a social space, like uh, uh, the Met or New York Library. It's, it's really meant as a, for sitting and conversing um, as much as movement. And then we're looking across at the park in front of the foundation building, and then we're looking through the stair, and you're looking out the window, and you, as you enter the building, you're already out of the building again, and you're looking at a neighboring building, right, a block away, and um, it's seen as an exterior slash interior kind of hybrid. And then again, looking down this, this space, I haven't got a slide I need yet, because when it's in the lunchtime, it's absolutely just packed. You have to kind of find your way through, and it just couldn't be more perfect. And then again, we're looking at these stairways, and now we're looking up into that space and um, through the 11th floor. And the stairs are all idiosyncratic. They're all different. Each one is unique. Each one is derived from its environment of the diagrid. So the diagrid is the formation of the actual geometry of the stair, and then they have, in turn, um, lights and lanterns and become part of this social structure. 
And then at the top, um, at two floors, again, a skip stop. You get off on uh, the fifth floor and the eighth floor. And then you're looking down at the foundation building. And these all have the public services, um, large public spaces, et cetera. And then again, looking out of this at the, um, the, um, the foundation building. OK, last building, last project, Shanghai. Um, I, I just finished this. I came back literally um, the day before yesterday from, from Shanghai. Um, a, a, it's a project for a campus um, for a ph pharmaceutical company in, um, in uh, just out of the outskirts of Shanghai. And um, you're going to look at a series of multiple systems that are, that are working to make um, a large, complicated organization that I'm going to talk about. And, um, but before I start that, again, I'm going to take you through kind of the history of this. Um, 12 years ago, I was working in Taipei, and it was the first time that we articulated this notion of multiple autonomous systems making up one thing. And so I can show you here the three, the four elements that make this thing up. And the notion is, is I can produce um, coherency. I can organize something with no repetition, with every element being different. So if you cut a section today, there's no section alike. And again, obviously showed up as a, as a factor with the far tower we're using. This is way later now, right? And what I'm interested in is producing really diverse environments which um, are clearly connected and coherent, right? Through a, a much more, um, through a different notion of organizing and through a series of associations which don't re require precise notions of repetition, axes, biaxes, et cetera. And then, first idea. Second idea is about the land. And I got very, very much influenced. We were talking about it the way about Raymond Abraham and, um, and Peachler, et cetera. Um, I went out to see Double Negative as, as a mm, middle 90s, I guess. And I was just completely startled. Um, architects make things, they build things. And I was a person that was very influenced by James Sterling. By the way, do you guys know who James Sterling is? No. Anybody? No. Anybody under 25? God, so interesting. Hold on to the discussion. Maybe it'll come up during the questions. Um, history's dead. James Sterling, I would have said, one of the major late 20th century architects. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, but that's another conversation. But it's, it's over, right? Um, um, he was additive. And he made things. And he was Victorian. and. Um, Architects kind of put things together and they're additive, right? And I looked at this and it's attractive and uh, it's spatial and it's a, a complete different, it's challenging, totally. And then, and then um, right at that same period of time we were doing a competition in, in Vienna and we, we did this kind of land augmentation and all of a sudden the land was taking program and um, it was taking as much program as building and, so, and we were challenging figure ground and right, that we're coming up with a whole new idea of, and again it took place in a competition we did in conjunction with, uh, with Wolf Pricks of Coupe Himmelblau. And, and then again in the JPA, J, JPJ project in Tokyo in 1990, where the building now is mostly subterranean, it was all part of a, a landscape environment. And then um, the school in 94, um, it's funny, we thought we'd do this in a residence and we couldn't get anybody. They, people want villas today and kind of opulent things that, that they know they spend a lot of money on. And to, to get a villa to disappear was just a hard idea to sell in this country. And, and finally, we, we got this project. It was a school, for a school district, and a normal budget and a high school. And um, I had this incredible superintendent of schools that just let us do some stuff. And this was the first, what is it? Not a drawing, not a model, a dwaddle, half model, half drawing. And, um, and we're just shaping earth. And that's going to um, take uh, the quarter million square feet of, of the building program. And then we're working now with engineers, and we're restructuring it. It's a little more disciplined. And, this is a later drawing, and then we built this. And, um, and then right after that, we won this competition again in, in um, Austria, and we built a Hoopa Bank. And now we have um, this low, low piece. Two thirds of the program is in a landscape element. And we're also building it very inexpensively that allows us to put investment in the more um, uh, um, aggressive, uh, dynamic forces of the work. And, and there's a relationship between now the, the, the ground piece and the the, the, the more traditional building piece, maybe morphology meets typology, where they come together that makes the kind of event of the building. And then right after that, a second building for these people in, in, um, in uh, Udine, Italy. And now we're using the landscape, the building, and infrastructure 
and we're incorporating infrastructural ideas so that the roadway, landscape, and building make a singular thing. And then you occupy this in-between space of the two landscapes of, of ground and new ground and allows you to um, orient and reorganize the site using this. And, um, and then part of that is the focus on public spaces and the public spaces now in this ID are completely connected as, as a notion. And so here we are, and again, I should have to say very little. Um, a project that's four, about a half a kilometer long, uh, 450 meters long from end to end across as a highway, it's a, um, a campus. And so in a way, uh, we saw it as a, um, as a model for a town. Um, administrative space, uh, lodging, hotel, recreational space, um, exhibit, a lecture hall, a gallery, library, the, the, the broad range of spaces that would be typical of a small town. And now here we are, and we have um, um, a series of individual elements that go right back to the project in Taipei that make up this organization. And we can now, um, this is so weird. Is the tech guy back there? We just tried this here. Moving this, oh, this is the one I came to show you guys. Oh, I can do it, ah, that, okay, okay, take it back. I apologize. Okay, I can take any element and I can look at the role it plays in this game. So I can take each of these elements and I can manipulate them and there I have a, a a program that allows me to um, control and organize a very, very complex set of conditions. And what I'm interested in is um, as, I'm, as I'm operating the system, um, as we're operating the system, architecture is a collective act, I'm working with my, my team, um, it's not personal. I'm not drawing lines, I'm discriminating as we're putting these things together in various combinations. And what I'm interested in is this territory between willfulness and chance. And what I'm interested in terms of its, um, the final product is um, able to, um, so I can show that line is the, that line right there is a, a pedestrian walk that goes from one end to the other and I can, I can look at that and describe how that works as it interconnects other spaces as well as its formal position. And um, what I'm looking for is accident. And I'm looking at something that mimics the traditional city that's produced over hundreds and hundreds of years. And like many of you, um, I'm more often interested in the accidents that take place between things than I am in the formal orders. Okay, an axis, an LA, a symmetry, oh, those are, okay, we understand that, right? And that they make up the basic organizational structure, mostly the grid, et cetera. But finally, the, the thing that's the most interesting is how that's used to produce another level of complexity, right? And, and, and if you look at any city that you admire, and it doesn't matter whether it's Florence or Mexico City or Tokyo, you name your city, that it would, I'm trying to um, um, deal with the reality of today's practice where the projects are getting larger and larger, because you're gonna enter the world when it's gonna be very common. You're gonna go to China and you're gonna be working on projects that are five million square feet, and it's common. Literally, it's common, right? It's, just, it's considered just a normal problem. And you're gonna do it in a year and a half with one architect. Huge problem, right? And um, my assessment is there's very few people that have got a handle on this, and I'm interested in dealing with this problem. And um, this is a project that gave me an opportunity. So out of that comes a series of plans and again, what I'm looking for is kind of radical differentiation. So I can talk about the differentiation of a gallery versus a library versus a recreation area versus a, an administrative wing, et cetera, et cetera. And I can also look at the role of its, its relationship to the land, the relationship of landscape and building, and this, um, uh, this interconnection between architecture and landscape, the fusion, right, of landscape and architecture. This, and, and so you look at the sections, and they're all kind of hugging the ground, or many of them are, right? as they connect the landscape. And then as you look at the repercussion of that, um, there's only 13% of building as it touches the site. 87% is landscape or hardscape, right? And again, that's a discussion of an of a ecological model. And then um, 
we're now working within a framework where we can again produce complicated things and simplify them. We're looking at the, the structure and the scan envelope, and we're articulating that now. And that goes to to um, to our subcontractor in Beijing. And again, we're looking at something that has many, many kind of unique parts that we can produce. And then um, this is what they make out of it. And um, are there any engineers out there? Um, if you look at this, um, fairly complicated piece, wasn't one mistake. They had a, over 6,000 individual elements in this thing. And I think there were six things that were five things that were, had to be redone. Really an amazing environment. And, and as the scale gets larger, they're not even single pieces. They're pieces that are already multiple pieces because of the scale, right? And um, it gets to be an extremely, extremely interesting project. I had two people that had done nothing but just organize this and um, produce it. And then um, the piece of work. Um, a, a more, um, it's a very soft kind of passive scheme as it becomes a landscape. And I thought it needed one stronger kind of monumental piece. Um, it's a cantilever of um, 45 meters, 150 feet. So it's about twice the length of this room. And um, it goes over the lake and it's part of a boardroom and the, the kind of the epicenter of the, of the project. And then you're looking at that area where the landscape is all building, of course, right? Under that are libraries and exhibit spaces, et cetera. And all the public kind of facilities. The landscape's a little bit fresh still. It's gonna look much nicer next year. And you're looking back from this movement space through a courtyard and then again through this long kind of twisting path. It's a very, um, just about a medieval idea, right? It takes you across a roadway and into the next part of the complex. Comp the complex. And then looking in um, one of the dining areas in the hall that came off of that courtyard. And again, you're gonna look at these elements that keep occurring, the, these, these um, five elements that make up the total language, and the interaction of that. So when you look at this, um, I didn't really shape that. Those are differencing processes of the relationships of those. I decided this one or that one, and then and every once in a while, somebody would take place and go, whoop, leave it. Uh, nice, right? We didn't really draw it. Um, tough environment, but we found um, you could actually make immensely precise things, more so than you could in this country, strangely enough. And uh, the workers had no shoes sometimes, and the screwdrivers were hand screwdrivers, a little a bucket that was made out of a tin can with a rope. I mean, really crazy and lovely. And um, here we are, and that path now leaves the building. The movement system escapes the building, uh, moves over the site, and then it's going to move through a library complex. And then we're looking below that at a space between. It just took place that becomes part of a movement system for part of the lower kind of elements. And then an element that goes over the highway as you're walking through this complex, again, looking at that element um, cut and looking into the library from the highway, and again, you see these elements in various formations that make up part of the structure. And again, above here, can you see my thing? Upper left, kind of a piece kind of pushed in there. We just left it as an idea. And um, again, that nose piece, because it goes over the highway. And now we're in this, um, the, the, the pathway again as, as, as it leaves the building as we're approaching the street, as we're just about to go over the street. Again, looking back the other way at the, um, the, on the uh, east end of the building. And then that path cuts through elements. You're looking down at the library. And again, here in that upper corner, that's, can you see the, the glass piece cutting through, right? And then this nose is it makes a connection to the street. And um, you're gonna get to this one also. Um, the client asked me what this did, this big nose piece. It's um, about 130 feet long. It does nothing it conceptually connects the building. It's absolutely necessary. It wouldn't work without it, right? So it doesn't do nothing, it does everything. It's the architecture. And um, if you get yourself in a situation where it has to work functionally, you're done. They'll not be, you'll, well, you won't be done. You'll get Cooper. Mm, yeah, closer. But you have to do this, because this is finally what architecture is about. And it's um, the notion of functionality is an obscene idea, or it's a very Calvinist one if, at the best. And um, uh, you have to have opportunities to um, really explore the nature of the potential of what architecture can do and can't do. And again, the shapes, um, these are intersections of two different systems. And I can go back and do four more, right? But they're coming out of an of a, of a operational strategy, and I'm fascinated with that idea. 
meaning I no longer have the single authority of the work. That make sense? It's, you're dealing with the strategy itself that, that produces the work, and you're, you're operating that methodology. We're across the highway again to the, to the um, rec center. And now these elements are structural elements. They're um, spanning large spans. They're also mechanical elements. They're seeping cold air and hot air and light. Pool, ditto. But you can see it, um, as it goes down, it cuts up again. You're in the landscape, you're looking out at the garden. Ditto. They're up in the gym looking down at the pool in a, a um, kind of a holding area. Or push air to the hotel and living facility. There's a place where the building gets very narrow and it's negative, and you occupy the space between. It's only about 10 feet wide, and so it's two huge pieces of glass carrying the roof, and you're just in this. It's an entry space for the hotel, but it's this completely kind of non-space. Here it is. Here the building kind of caves in, and there's water on one side and a road on the other, and then you can see the roof that dives into the into the lake, and then behind us, um, the the lobby the desk for the, the hotel and living complex, and a, a drawing, which is the conceptual drawing of the building that we put back on. It's, um, it's 100 feet long. And um, um, one of the exhibit spaces. And again, um, we're looking out of this corridor um, back into the, um, to the, the koi pond and the part of the lake. And then the nose you're looking at, the cantilevered, is the conference room, glass floor. You're over the lake, glass table. You're suspended over that place, and you're looking out at a future site that will become the next part of the campus. And um, you're just suspended over this water mass. And then an entry part to the hotel, and uh, a piece of the work as um, this in-between landscape and architecture by Ewan Bond that just got literally hours ago. And again, another court for um, sunbathing and exterior stuff that comes with the hotel and the recreation area. And then I'm going to end. Is it OK? Can I, have I got seven minutes? Go for it. All right. I thought, again, um, pretend you're me. I'm just still trying to figure out what I'm doing. And um, I just moved my office um, two months, three months ago. And as I was moving, uh, I'm putting together a shop in my main office in LA and an archive that had been separate for, for about 10 years. And as the archive came in, I was uncreating everything, and I had to look at everything personally to say it was OK, blah, blah, blah. And as I did that, I was finding all these conceptual drawings that you, were, you mentioned in the introduction, um, conceptual work. And I'd realized I haven't done um, just about nothing for 15 years. As we started getting the bigger work, I was just totally inundated in the, uh, the demands of running the practice with this larger scale work. And we've been working at a very ferocious kind of pace. And I, I realized how important it is. And I went back, and I decided to take um, the exact program I just gave you in an abstract way. Um, these are four elements. And um, they're extremely simple. And I'm going to produce, um, I'm up to 30 right now, individual spatial paintings, let's say, spatialized paintings. And they're um, prototypes. They're 26 by 26 by 2 inches. And um, what you're going to look at is, um, each of these is made out of the identical genetic material, four elements, right? And so they all belong to a, a species, a single species. And what I'm going to try to do is talk about the, um, the huge range of possibilities in terms of the differences produced by this very simple kind of idea of these. these um, this has already been redone. Um, a lot of these have already gone through a critique and are on the second reiteration. And, but every one of these is made out of the identical material. And the only other rule is they have to define the site, the site being the 26 by 26 by 2. right? And so some of them take a more minimal strategy and some more literal. And they're also interested in, um, I think I'm interested in the, the location of beauty. And not beauty as a cultural act, because I don't believe in that. Cult um, beauty is highly specific to one's education, one's access to a particular um, formation of art, um, ethnicity, language, on and on, right? But I'm interested in something more fundamental, if there's something that goes beyond that particular cultural act, if there's actually something that's universal. And um, I'm looking at, like I started with my very first conversation with my work with, with, um, with Ralph Knowles as an, under as an undergraduate. Um, 
I'm looking at not literally mimetic, uh, something mimetic of nature. I'm looking at the system of nature and the notion of um, the relationship that take place under ecological rules that produce um, um, predictable acts. And it's that prediction, that's ba it's that act of predictability that's, that we understand science by. Right? And um, I have no idea whether these are beautiful or not beautiful, but that's not finally what I'm, I'm engaged with. I'm engaged just in the idea itself. But what I'm most interested in is it's, um, the uniqueness that's available with this singular system. This is the first, I'm not sure what I showed you, 15. We've got 15 more in the works. And this will be a project that'll be easy to exhaust because we can no longer produce anything unique, we're done, right? And these are the prototypes. We're now just built the first six by six, by six inches, and it's a completely different thing when it envelops you. And we're now starting to build the, the final pieces, which could be much larger in scale. And you can see as you look at them closely, they absolutely become models for urban constructs, right? Does that make sense? Totally connected to the last project I showed you. And it's interesting because I'm working with um, two of my Cornell students that I finally convinced you could make architecture with, with an outside and program, and we spent 15 weeks. And I brought them to the office, and I've been working on these now for about three months. And um, I talked to nobody in my office about it. It's just kind of a little mystery thing, and I'm just slowly putting them on the walls. And it's really interesting what it does to uh, 40 people. They're looking at it and going, hmm, what's going on? What's Tom up there? And it, but it's just like this. Everybody goes, oh, oh, we know what's going on. He's doing this. We're working on, literally, they'd go, we're working on Shanghai still, aren't we? And then just really quickly, um, stuff in the office at the moment, a competition in Taiwan for three theaters, lost at the Rem Cool House. A um, competition in Shenzhen for a tower next to uh, Rem again, in this case, um, uh, for the stock exchange in Shenzhen. Um, just negotiated a contract with this one. Um, a project in Dallas um, for the Natural Museum of Nature and History. Um, which is um, just under construction. Another discussion of skin, randomness of skin. Uh, we're working with a very, very kind of simple um, concrete panel that's turning out quite interesting. Uh, a project for the new Emerson School of Theater in Los Angeles, which is uh, starting construction in about two weeks. A competition for London, we lost. Uh, killer. Worse than this one. Thought we nailed this one. Didn't get it. And if we started another lecture, um, it would move in a totally different direction. It would move into urban design. Um, a series of studies I did with my, my students at UCLA on LA Now, and then we went to um, Madrid. And, 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 uh, and that has culminated in a book that's going to come out in, in uh, January on combinatorial urbanism that represents um, uh, 12 projects I worked on over the last eight years. And I will not, I will end there. Thank you very much for your patience. Yeah, I would more than gladly answer the best part for sure for me. History. Huh. Um, I don't know. I, I came out of a very um, confused time. The educational system had kind of broken down in the 60s. And of course, the 60s were the social stuff. And I was a Vietnam draft kid. And so a huge amount of my energy wasn't even in architecture. It was connected to what was going on in the country at that time. And it was a unique time where they empowered students to a degree that was unheard of. And, um, and then with that, um, I look back now, and I, I, I hadn't realized how much I was influenced by artistic activity outside of architecture. Um, music, um, enormously. Film, um, again, I was in an era that they weren't art films. You saw Godard, Truffaut, Fellini, Antonioni. They were just films that all your buddies saw, right? And they hugely influenced me. Um, I think by my nature as being interested in the contemporary, 
and what's going on now, that I was never been, history was a class I had to take an architect, that is a student, I took history class, and it, um, um, it didn't, it was compulsory to some degree, um, and, and yet I come from a family that's right off the boat. Um, my mother's the first child, my grandfather was born in London, my grandmother Copenhagen, the other ones are farmers that go back a longer. And um, my mother went to school in the Sorbonne, and I mean, I, I, I'm rooted in European culture in my family, but it just didn't strike me. And um, um, so part of it's just your personality. I watch my two boys now, and, and they have just, they're, they're just set up to be interested in certain things by their nature, their DNA makeup, right? Um, I think what takes place is it, it becomes more conscious, probably, right? And it, it became kind of evident quite, when well, I was quite young, certainly in my 20s, that um, the barriers to doing innovative architecture in this country were very much connected to um, a priori notions of um, a prevalence of something that was um, historical. And, um, and it became an immediate uh, dilemma. It was an impediment. Right? And, and then when you really start, I'm a person that's done all the compulsory stuff, Rome, Florence, and we could rattle off, right? And, and uh, um, Bernini shows up in my interests and influences, and uh, uh, Guardini more so, and, and Torino, and uh, okay, I'm an, I trained as an architect. Um, but um, I'm just, I'm by nature interested in the present and in, in possibilities. And um, what you're looking at in history are, are those things that outlast the specificity of its condition. You're looking for that that, that gives, they're still open for a lesson. The um, Michelangelo's Infinito, I could have said when I showed you the dusting off slide. So I'm, I'm, we're dusting that off. I'm showing images in the office and Pavel walks up to me and goes, oh, Michelangelo and Infinito. And two days later, I have an article on the Infinito. Of course, right? The, uh, um, so you can, look, you can look at his sculptures and they're the, the emergence. Well, emergence is something extremely interesting today and everywhere that is being written about, right? Various theories of, of emergence. And um, he was absolutely connecting to that instant act, right? Of the figure that came out of the stone, the inert stone. And it's just, it'll, never, it'll change its form. It'll change its delivery, but it'll never get any better. <laughs> that's right. The phenomena won't change. It's, it's there forever. And that's the interesting part. You know? The rest of it is, um, I have to say, that I would ask the audience, it's probably also connected to a political stance. Because I would say the same, and my, my attitudes would probably be similar in cultural and political and social issues. Because this country I find very exciting as an experiment socially and culturally and politically. But it's, the resistance to it is not interesting at all. And of course, it's a, a time that we're, we're it, it's prioritizing. The, the, we're, we're conflicted at the moment as a culture in terms of um, the, um, what the aspirations are of this country. And there's one group that are going backwards. And it's, um, for me, the argument is preposterous and childish. And it's not even worth comment other than the fact that it's real. And I'm probably insulting people in this room. And, um, and then you have to deal with it. And, um, but it's, in my own brain, just totally preposterous. And the, the, the level of discourse is so childlike. It's literally, I was going to say 14-year-old, but I'd be embarrassed if my children had arguments like this at 14. It'd be eight or nine years old or something. Um, at a precise time, when we need intelligent discourse of actually where we are and what the issues are. right? And we don't have that discourse right now. And I, I find there's a huge parallel. I think I started my lecture saying that as I was reading Rich's article of the weekend, uh, it, it occurred to me that there's a parallel in our profession. Because I would have said the American scene architecturally is mm, not particularly interesting at this moment of time. If you look at globally, the architectural output in terms of innovation is, is pretty frightening, actually, what's coming out of this country. Um, funny, as young students, um, I went to Rome and Florence and London and Paris and you know, that, that trip, um, I would head over to China, get there for 700 bucks. 
on their time, maybe less, and um, go from Beijing all the way down to Guangzhou or somewhere, and um, take a look. You'll be flabbergasted, totally flabbergasted, what the possibilities are. Little, also problems, there'll be other issues that come up, and um, technology can be a little rough sometimes, but look at what the possibilities are. It's just amazing. You're looking at a culture that does not have the problems we do. They are interested in their economic development and where their position of the world, right? And they're focused. We're mucking around with whether uh, um, like sex people should be married or whether uh, an abortion is, is legal or illegal or moral or immoral. All kinds of personal stuff should, that the government should have nothing to do with, absolutely nothing to do with, right? And, and we're failing economically. We're gonna be a second rate nation, there's no question. Talk to corporate heads. I, my, most of my clients now are corporate heads. Well, you get in a private room, they've got a lot of money and don't worry about it, and they'll give a ton of it money to their next generation so they don't have to worry about it either, but they're totally frightened about what's going on in this country. Zero innovation, zero dealing with the problems, and if you'll go to China or India, you're gonna be just startled, and they're very aggressive about it. The young people are wonderful. They're very polite culture, and they're, they're, they're not arrogant about it, but they'll just say, well, uh, the Europeans had the 19th and the early, early 20th. You got the 20th. The 21st is ours. And they're right. There's no question, right? But to me, there's that, am I making any sense? There's a connection between um, the attitudes of history, meaning the past, right? And like when people say they want, um, um, whether architecture or politically, they want to go back to the 19th century, why doesn't anybody just ask them, what the hell are they talking about? Um, women's rights? Um, the relationship of uh, minority status, which didn't happen until the 60s, uh, the relationship of medical care to a vast group of people, uh, economic rights for workers, the medical care itself, what the hell are they talking about? They have to be out of their mind, right? An immensely primitive environment compared to what took place in the 20th century. No one would tolerate it in this country if they actually had a, a reasonable conversation and actually played that argument out. It's an absurd, absolutely obscene argument, right? Which is really destructive. And I think an architecture takes you to the same place. It gives you dead on arrival work that never got started. It never had a beginning idea. It's, 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 it, it was dead before they started construction. Am I being too strong? Why bother, really? Find something you can make a living at and go do it. Why even bother? You're just, um, you're, beavers and, and ants do better. Because they, they, they just build functional things. They do it very well, right? and they have instincts of how to survive. And, um, but it doesn't have broader cultural meaning. And um, well, as far as we know, right? And um, maybe it does. Um, but you probably are gonna think you're gonna do better than a beaver as you build your logs. By the way, a lot of you, a lot of architects don't do as well as beavers come to think of it. Um, they, they're automatically incredibly uh, in syncopation with their broader environment and they survive by the understanding on multiple levels. Water flows, differentiation year to year, changes in seasons, availability of certain kind of wood stock, I mean, on and on. It's actually kind of an amazing kind of an event, right? They're dams. And um, we should at least get to that level, <laughs> right? But it's, um, it's a dilemma. And I think the over-articulation, it just, it just keeps the, your eye off the ball in a way if you keep discussing kind of old models. Because the discussion should be then what's useful in that old model that I can go forward with. Right, that gives me a program. Uh, uh, there was a, a moment in the presentation where you said to the audience, you know, uh, what do you think this does? What kind of work do you think it's, it's doing? And you, you responded by saying nothing but everything. Uh, and 
functionality, but they seem to be kind of revving up for another kind of leap in your career. And you can certainly see that that area of commitment took place during the 70s and the 80s in those drawings that I was speaking to. So at a time where there is such talk about politics, there is such propaganda that encircles the question of sustainability and the kind of global responsibility that citizens are to have to take on the demands and challenges of buildings in relation to energy, in relation to metrics. In other words, there's a kind of ethic that is being disseminated about what constitutes a correct behavior or incorrect behavior. This room is filled with students that are inheriting the planet and certainly have access to technology earlier in their career that you and I never had. Can you speak more directly about what kinds of considerations or nationalism should take place around that topic in relation to this other kind of poetic and ineffable topic? Well, there's several ways. Could you hear him? Okay. As you work on larger scale projects, it seems like there are multiple clients and multiple constituencies like there are in politics. And I think you're obliged as an architect or you're just about, it's mandatory for survival that the work has to merge performances, various performances, including energy and architecture. And so I showed you three buildings that all operate at a very top level performance wise energy. First one, no air conditioning. Second one, a platinum in New York. Third one, they don't rate it that way, but it's underground and it's usually, usually efficient. With architecture, but I think a lot of the technologies, the digital environment allows us to deal simultaneously with these two spheres, let's say, and put them together. We have an ability to deal with more and more complex information and to organize it. And when he said about the change, I just let a whole bunch of people go and I'm restructuring my office right now. I'm doing it right now. By January, I'm going to take a different direction and I'm trying to move. And you know, Corbusier fired everybody every three years and you can totally understand it because your own office starts thinking they know how to do it and I don't know how to do it. So I know it's a problem. And so I go, oh, everybody now goes, you get more and more knowledge. And the problem with knowledge is empirical knowledge is that now you use that knowledge and we're all habitual creatures. And so we've done it. Well, let's do it again and let's do this one again. And it starts slowing down your ability to innovate. And so if you're interested in innovating at times, you have to restrange the structure and you recognize the location of that innovation. I don't know quite how to answer your question other than it's, finally, architecture is definitely locatable. Whatever your music taste, a particular aria, Prokofiev, Op 89, Patti Smith, The Doves Cry. Anybody know Patti Smith? The Doves Cry, you know that? You can weep, it's incredibly powerful. How can you say what it's, it's, it's about human beings <laughs> that affect you deeply? That's what art is, right? And it somehow moves you and it makes your life valuable. When you go to a really good concert or something really, really valuable to you and you leave and your first thought is, this is why I'm fucking alive. This is why we exist, right? This person just took me someplace and reminded me what human beings can do and who we are, right? And um, that's, what, that's what architecture is, but it doesn't have quite that power a lot of times because it's inert and it's so functional and it's got to keep air out and snow and blah, blah, blah. And, um, but finally, that's what art is. You're trying to move somebody. You're trying to move yourself. <laughs> You're trying to prove you can actually do something that has an effect on other people, right? 
And, and luckily, ours operates on multiple levels. It's a complex form. You work on it a long time. So it can operate on people in different ways. It can be intellectual versus emotional. It can be interested in tectonics. It can just work well and function better than the, it can be a better gadget, and on and on, right? And so you've got lots of ways you can affect people. But, um, but I'm still kind of interested in the, the emotional one. I want to actually push you. And I'd love to make you weep. I'd love to somehow do something that actually affects you and that, um, that you haven't seen before and it takes you someplace. Because that's, that's, that's what we do. That's, that's the potential. That's the absolute outer edge of what you can, you can reach if you can, if you can get there. And because of that, you can never be very arrogant because you, you kind of never get there, actually. You kind of get there, <laughs> right? But there's always that part that didn't get there that goes, okay, I gotta try it again. I got 80% there or 70% there and let's figure out another one, right? And, um, but it's finally what architecture is and you can't ask what it does. You're already dead. If you ask what it does, you, what do you mean, what does it do? <laughs> Just, again, apply that to music or sculpture or an art form. Right? If, if you look at Guernica and you ask, what does it do? You mean, what the fuck do you mean, what does it do? It, it talks about the nature of human um, hostility in the most incredibly powerful way that if you didn't get it, you, you had no clue. What, you, you'll never get it then, right? That kind of thing, right? So it's how you want to speak is what it's talking about, right? And it's what kind of voice you want to have. And when you're young and you get out of school, um, the thing you need to fight for is your voice. That's what you really fight for. Don't let them take your voice. That's what you're fighting for. You're fighting for yourself and for your voice. And I suspect there's not a person in this room that didn't choose architecture in some way because some aspect of you senses that architects do have an opportunity to actually speak. Very different than a huge amount of professions. And in your school is different. You get to speak already. You produce your own work. You stand up in front of a jury that tries to rip you apart or whatever, right? You defend it. You talk about it. It's yours, it's personal, you can't believe it. There's no blue book, there's no bullshitting your way through it. You show it up and everybody knows exactly what it is, how much time you put into it. You, it's absolutely impossible to fake it, right? And it's a very gutsy education. It, it's why it's very useful for a lot of different areas if you use it as a liberal arts, probably, right? Because it's one of the last platonic forms of education. My son goes to St. John's. This is literally, I think there's only three or four left. They start with Plato and Aristotle. And it's, it, it used to be educated. My father went to Indiana in the 20s and was one of 15 people that graduated out of philosophy, 15. There's probably, what, 55,000 there now? And um, you read the Harvard Classics. That was considered education. You weren't trained, you were educated, right? And then you went on to decide whether you wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor or an architect or whatever. But anyway, you were already in an educational system where I suspect all of you must have this seed in you already, that you already realize that you stand up day after day presenting your ideas, right? and that you, you want to protect that voice, and you want to nurture and develop that voice, and it's hard, for sure. It's a tough one. We're done. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>